Today, I'm going to share four of my favorite pre-med advanced techniques that will make any application more competitive. How to network with your dream medical schools, including word-for-word -word email templates you can use today to build that relationship now. How to use the AAMC's Anatomy of an Applicant section, a place many pre-meds don't know about, to hear directly from admissions committees on why they selected the medical students they did. How to use the AAMC's AdCom workshops to perfectly customize your writing to tailor fit your personality and your journey. If becoming a doctor is important to you and you understand how high stakes getting into medical school is today, you are going to want a leg up on your competition. And these are the exact four things I wish I did when I was in your shoes. Number one, authentically connecting with your top 10 dream medical schools. Many pre-meds have shared that the difference for them during the admission cycle is the existing relationship they had with that school and their faculty members. One pre-med shared with me that during multiple of her interviews, the interviewer had already been introduced to them by other faculty members, sharing how awesome she was. If you walk into a room anxious and nervous because you think this is going to be your shot at becoming a doctor, but the interviewer opens with a warm welcome, that makes everything easier. It's like playing on home court advantage. And I think in pre-med culture, there's this common misconception that reaching out to your dream medical schools is cringe, try hard, or not fair for some reason. And I understand where that's coming from. I have seen multiple examples of pre-meds trying to win over favors from medical schools, and that's not what this is. How these pre-meds built strong relationships with these medical schools were through common ground, consistency, and authenticity. So let's get to how we're going to actually do this. First, start by generating a list of values that are important to you when selecting a medical school. They can be as simple or as complicated as you'd like. For pre-med Mike, that would have been exposure to orthopedic surgery, basic science research. That would have been people coming from Southern California. That would have been faculty members who are interested in underserved populations, particularly immigrant populations. And lastly, that would have been examples of faculty members who have built successful careers in the intersection of healthcare and management. Think of your MD, MBA types. I was hoping to be an orthopedic surgeon, MD, MBA, when I was a senior in college. And while things have changed, certainly, those would have been valuable for me when selecting my schools. Then, I recommend you look at your school list and select the top 10 schools that you think you're most likely or most happy to go to and start doing your peripheral research. What programs do they have? What faculty members are working in your area of interest? And what are their projects about? For example, if you went to UCLA, you might notice that Dr. Bernthal, the chair of the orthopedic surgery department, has a large basic science lab working in perioperative joint infection. And you might also notice that Dr. Croymans, an MD MBA, is working on a ton of quality improvement projects in the area of colon cancer screening. Jot down these specific names, programs, and opportunities because those will be the exact things you reference in your emails. Then we're going to start searching for the people who might be able to best answer our questions. I encourage you to write them in personas or abstract versions or descriptions of a person so that someone can point you in the right direction of the person you're looking for. For example, for me, a persona might be a orthopedic surgeon leading a research laboratory on campus, a medical student who was born and raised in Southern California and maybe went to UCLA, a faculty member who works primarily in underserved clinics or hospitals, and then an MD MBA who splits his time between clinic and administration. If you aren't able to find these people by searching medical school, orthopedic surgery, medical school, underserved populations, medical school, healthcare administration, then those phrases that you've generated will be put into an email to a school administrator or a dean of admissions, and they certainly will know who to refer you to. This technique has two huge benefits that really compound on each other. First is that you'll get information that is not on a medical school website. 
You'll get it firsthand from the medical students and the professors themselves, and that information should go on your interview day. That information should find its way onto the secondary application. It's so specific. And the second benefit is that you're demonstrating, you're putting in more work to learn about the program, be invested about the program, be an advocate for the program, that it's a clear demonstration of your interest. Medical schools do not know how you will perform when you get on campus. They can only make guesses. And so if you are able to demonstrate your interest up front, so your work up front, that helps them feel more confident about you. And of course, to make things easier, we have an exact plug and play, word for word email templates, including subject lines that you can use today to send out to those busy medical students and professors and get a response. Always free, available in the description box below. Every year, over 50,000 pre-meds apply to medical school and over 60% don't get into a single one. If this video hasn't been completely trashed thus far, I highly encourage you to take a look at the free resources we have in our description box below. Click the link in the description box to find out more. And for now, let's go back to the video. Number two, the AAMC's Anatomy of an Applicant section. This section shares real students with real stories demonstrating real pre-med core competencies. You can learn a lot about these applicants. You know where they go to medical school now, what experiences caught the eyes of their dream medical schools, and personally, what I find to be most helpful is that the medical school admission committee themselves is interviewed and they answer the question, why did I accept this student with specific details and references to their experiences? It's unparalleled access to learn exactly what goes on behind the scenes and how admissions committees feel about the students they accepted. If there's one to read, it would be Nadia Scott's. She's my personal favorite. You can see how her interests evolved over time, ultimately leading to her residency specialty decision. She worked with the physical therapy and rehabilitation departments, serving veterans and helping them acclimate back to society after their stint at war. And she continued her work in rehabilitation at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, helping sick children find some sense of normalcy in the midst of living in a hospital with an illness. And here is exactly why Cooper Medical School ultimately accepted Nadia verbatim straight from the admissions committee member, him or herself. Nadia's descriptions and narratives throughout the AMCAS application provided very valuable insight into her character and personality, especially about her capacity to connect her actions to the greater good. Nadia's maturity and sense of personal accountability were immediately apparent. Nadia's written responses indicated ownership of her experiences and reactions, confidence in her capacity to meet challenges, and subtle but important indications that she would respond to setbacks or challenges with perspective needed to learn from trying situations. In her secondary application, Nadia said, cities and urban environments are often populated with underprivileged and low-income families. In short, this was the type of community I was raised in and akin to as a Philadelphian. Living as a member of an underrepresented population, I observed many health issues in my community. So you can see there, that specific portion of the secondary really stood out to Cooper Medical School. And why is that? And well, it's because of their mission statement, which they describe in the next paragraph. The mission statement of Cooper Medical School of Rowan University is committed to providing humanistic education in the art and science of medicine within a scientific and scholarly community in which inclusivity, excellence in patient care, innovative teaching, research, and service to our community are valued. Our core values include a commitment to diversity, personal mentorship, equity, professionalism, collaboration, mutual respect, civic responsibility, patient advocacy, and lifelong learning. According to the admissions team, Nadia did a wonderful job in her entire application showing a consistent story and one that resonated perfectly with our medical school. Her mission of service to others and the way she has organized her life's priorities made her an ideal fit with the mission and values of our medical school. Her mission was our mission. 
We knew from her application that she would thrive at CMSRU. For me, the huge takeaways are understanding the overlap between your story and a medical school's mission and really trying to show that on your writing, as well as the importance of demonstrating your priorities. Cooper Medical School really appreciated that she spent a lot of her time in rehabilitation type activities and that to them signaled a person dedicated to service. Read these student profiles if you want to know exactly why other medical schools accepted standout pre-med students. The third advanced technique is leveraging the AAMC admissions committee's workshops because they're led directly by admissions committee members who are making decisions on your application. All right, I think one thing most pre-meds underappreciate, just because sometimes the AAMC website can be hard to navigate and they don't have the largest social media presence on platforms that we're more comfortable with. However, one thing that they underappreciate, most pre-meds, including myself, is the quality of contents that the AMC puts out. For example, this workshop has been out for years and not only seven years, and not only has only 4,000 people, remember 50,000 people apply to medical school every single year, Probably at any one time, there's 150 to 250,000 pre-meds. Over seven years, has only been seen 4,000 times on YouTube. The quality of these workshops is unbelievable. And let me kind of share with you this particular one. The link will be down in the description box below. It's my personal favorite. This is a webinar recording titled How to Present Yourself as a Strong Applicant. And the AMC asks admissions committee members from top schools, including the University of Maryland, including the University, uh, including Cornell University, a school now that has near free, that has free tuition for any household income less than 120,000 or something like this. But the admissions committees themselves peel open the doors and show you behind the scenes what they look for, specifically when they are trying to discern who gets into their schools and who does not. So why don't we take a look at some of the most pertinent slides in this show or in this um, presentation and feel free to watch it for yourself as well. But I'll show you what I took away as well as what we have taken from these admissions committees incorporated into our own mentorship products uh, and advising for our application cycle students um, and where it comes from. So this is WC or Weill Cornell Medical College's definition of a strong applicant. So in, in addition to the critical qualities listed below, we look for applicants who have investigated the field of medicine and gained research experience. So they're big on research, they're big on people who understand the field of medicine. So if you're coming in with 25 sparse shadowing hours, you're already at a huge disadvantage because they want you to understand where, where um, the, the field of medicine is going, understand that context and everything within it. So what are we looking for? A combination of outstanding academic accomplishments. We're looking at breadth, depth, and rigor. We're looking at character conducive to the best practice of medicine, emotional maturity, integrity, personal depth, commitment to others. So think about incorporating some of those themes into your writing. We're looking at exceptional personal initiative in leadership, creativity, research, community service, motivation, or other life experiences. So if you're sitting there on the chair wondering how can I make myself more competitive Ask yourself, how is my academic accomplishments? Is it rigorous? Is the depth there? Is the breadth there? Character, that's difficult. How do I demonstrate my character through my activities, through the accomplishments that I've had? If I'm in a community service organization, can I think of a time where I dem demonstrated emotional maturity? Can I think of a time where I showed personal depth or integrity? If I cannot, then that should trigger me to reflect a little bit and think about worthwhile projects to pursue in the next six months to a year that would demonstrate that value. So when I get to the interview, or when I get to the secondary, I can answer that question with confidence because I've intentionally sought out to exemplify that value. 
Same with personal initiative. A lot of pre-meds will say, I've got all my activities, my CV looks all buttoned up, my grades are good. Uh, I just need to be a leader or stand out and I don't know how to do that. Well, they're showing you right there. It says personal initiative in leadership, creativity, research. So in your research, can you take on an independent research project? In your community organizations, what project has your team been talking about but not been able to succeed in? Delve deep into that. That is your golden goose egg and that's the thing that you are going to be proud of and it's going to lead the charge uh, of and be the star of your application. This triple Venn diagram overlaps um, is the Cornell definition of a strong applicant and your best self. And I find it as a very helpful guide to uh, demonstrate or to show pre-meds, that's where you need to go to. Another thing that we love is they understand that all of us, including myself, have tendencies when we write or when we speak. Are you more terse? Are you more wordy? Are you flippant and you're just making jokes left and right? That's kind of me. Are you unenthusiastic and different, kind of without tone or tenor? Are you scattered and you're just thinking left and right, no outline, no, you're not really looking, making eye contact. You can do that in person. You can do that with uh, a written piece, like a work and activities or a personal statement. Are you unfiltered? Maybe sharing a little bit too much, right? Or are you too buttoned up and not sharing too much of yourself? Knowing your tendencies is important because then you can err on the other side. You can balance yourself out intentionally, putting guardrails and forcing your editors, forcing anyone who's mentoring you to say, hey, I know I come off typically, my natural instinct is to be terse and wordy, or terse or wordy, am, am I coming across that way and how can I, if I am, how can I adjust? I loved this topic or this thought so much I've never heard of it in the last seven years that I incorporated into our application cycle writing tendencies section. So I will ask students, do you believe you're terse or detailed, wordy or succinct, casual or academic, indifferent or animated? And taking that information, we will move them to the other side so that they're more balanced. Uh, there's no red flags we're uh, that we're demonstrating in our writing or interview. Um, and we can come across as a better version, a more uh, nuanced version of ourselves by recognizing our tendencies. Whatever your habitual style, adjust your communication in the direction of your best self. Uh, this is, I believe, from the University of Maryland. These are the four main questions that every school is assessing when they're thinking about your application. Number one, can you do it? Described by your grades, your MCAT score. Will you do it? Described by your extracurriculars, motivations, written experiences. Should you do it? The interview and uh, whether you come across as genuinely the authentic person that your CV suggests you are, and should you do it here with us in our culture, with our resources, that comes in in the secondary. So if you're ever thinking, how are people, where would people knock me out of the running? Can I do it? Would it be my grades? Will I do it? Do my, does my extracurriculars or resume or CV demonstrate that I have intentionality and I ha I'm a go-getter that gets things done? Or does it show that I'm kind of in the background, watching as things unfold, kind of riding along and contributing where I am, but uh, where I can, but at the bare minimum? Should you do it? Are your interview skills lackluster? You come across as indifferent and not energizing. And should you do it here? Do you understand the school's mission? Do you understand which school would best suit your career goals and which school and culture can you provide the most to their community? Schools will recognize that as well as you do, but both parties need to think intently about it. And then lastly, how do you tell your story? Also from the University of Maryland. Make sure you're journaling about your activities and when you're doing, be mindful and present while pursuing them. I always say when I'm having a rough a hospital shift, I always tell myself, I'm recognizing I'm present right now. This shift sucks and I feel like I'm not contributing or I'm not on my game. And the thing that I tell myself is, I can choose to restart here. I can choose to start again. And that thought helps me 
throw away whatever the last couple of hours have given me and start again and try to do the rest, do the best with the three minutes that I have left on shift or the three hours that I have on, left on shift or the three patients I have yet to see. Be mindful, be present while in your activities and journal about them so you remember. Cultivate strong relationships with your mentors. The letters of recommendations will say volumes about you. Be straightforward and genuine. Uh, no wild anecdotes are needed. No one needs to die. No one needs uh, their life saved. You need to tell your authentic story. And if that's part of it, fine. But also recognize if it's not, that's also okay. Focus not only on the what, but the why and the meaning you made of being in that setting. Why? Tell me why. Share me the details. Open up your mind and let the reader into what you're thinking and feeling and what you're going to do about it. Right? Those are the th ways that you can tell your story. And it's not my original advice. This is advice directly from admissions committees, and you can't get better advice from that. I hope that you continue to watch the AMC's workshops and the media they put out. It is fantastic and has given me a new perspective on how to best advise our students, and I hope it did the same for you. Number four, my personal favorite, reviewing interview game film. I think it's invaluable to see your performance from a third party perspective. It's difficult because we see the world through our own eyes and with recordings or a camera, we can often see what we look like from a different perspective. This helps us see if what we're intending to come across as actually matches what the camera or the recording sees. In addition, it's really difficult and odd to review your own self, hear your own voice, but some of those experiences then make interviewing much more comfortable. To give you a sense of what I mean, take a look at this mock interview and we'll review some segments together. All right, let's take a look at this mock interview. I think there's a lot of good things here. I'll put the link in the description box below so you can watch the entire thing, but I'll highlight a couple of questions that I found very telling. First and foremost, I am not trying to come off as critical. I think we can all take constructive criticism and get better at our craft from uh, time to time. And this is no this is no exception to this. If you recorded my interviews and folks had thoughts about how I spoke in that setting and how I approached some of those questions, undoubtedly I could have done better. I'm not criticizing either of them in any way. I think they did both an excellent job, an excellent service to all the people in the classroom and all the thousands of people who have watched these interviews now because they have given access. But I just wanted to open with that. It takes a lot of courage to do this live in person with a classroom of 30 people watching you. So let's take a look Look at it together. This is the University of Dayton's Dr. DeBard is here, and I, uh, Emma Clark is on this side. She's already been accepted to medical school, and she's doing this mock interview so that folks can learn from her experience. Let's get started. I had to try out a few systems within myself before I was able to effectively um, take that criticism and make a positive change. Um, well, that's a good example, but I want to direct it a little differently. Mm -hmm. let's, let's direct it towards maybe a new skill or knowledge base that you had to acquire or something. I, some people tell me about uh, how they learned to play the guitar on their own or... Uh... So immediately when I'm in this situation and the interviewer clearly has demonstrated that he or she is not Satis excuse me, satisfied with my answer in some way, shape, or form, the nervousness immediately starts kicking in. I totally understand this feeling. And she's trying to understand, okay, what was about that answer that he didn't really resonate with? Where is he trying to take this to? And let's see how she adapts. Uh, some skill like that to learn mm -hmm. to uh, repair the brakes on their car. <laughs> uh, some other part of your life, perhaps, a skill that you had to learn. Mm -hmm. Didn't get asked this question, huh? <laughs> no, I, uh, um, I would like to keep thinking about it if you don't mind. All right. Um, I love how she diffuses it with a laugh. I think, I've, and I, I know, I find that most interviews are, they err on the more casual side. So if, pe if you can get someone to laugh, to relax, to talk about themselves, that makes the interview feel less suffocating. When you're in this position where all eyes are on you and you're at being asked questions that are a little bit difficult or out of the woods, these pauses 
and asking for more time is totally appropriate and saves herself or gives herself some room to think, but you don't want to be in this situation in the first place. You want the conversation to flow and you can see she's spending a lot of time thinking. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, um, this doesn't relate, uh, you know, specifically to medicine at all, but, um, coming, doesn't have to. Yeah. Coming into college, um, I had to learn how to cook for myself hmm. and make meals um, to, you know, help me out through the week. So um, I've been doing some meal prepping and crock pot meals. Um, how and did you learn this? I just did research on the internet um, to try to find quick and easy meals that I could make on a Sunday and would last me all throughout the week. Um, so while, uh, you know, it really has helped me save time actually. Um, so I pretty much every Sunday I do a meal prep for the week. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've learned in college on my own, just finding that trying to make a meal every single night while balancing my studies and extracurriculars wasn't really an efficient option. Okay. Tell me about some kind of uh, setback you've had in your life. Mm -hmm. And you can read his body language, right? Okay. Tell me about something else. He was over that question, right? It, I mean, in my eyes, it didn't seem like he was interested in the first answer. I know I cut that off just to transition to the second one to demonstrate that kind of long pause. But you can tell he also wasn't really interested in that second answer either because he forwarded the conversation so quickly. Sometimes these questions are not meant to spark discussion. They're meant to make you feel uncomfortable, meant to see how you take that pressure and uh, adapt to the context of the situation. And I honestly don't know how he felt about this. As the interviewee, I'm getting a little bit nervous because when I can't read the other person, I don't know how they're feeling. I don't know if we're taking it or moving in the right direction or I need to stop, make a big U-turn and push it the other way. And the other comment that I had to make is notice in that answer for her, that was a really tough answer for her to get out, right? She thought about it for a long time. She came up with this meal prepping on Sundays with a crock pot and the rest of it isn't really detailed no real recipes no real kind of story about how he she and her roommates do it together no real kind of like mother's inspiration for this favorite meal uh, taco Tuesday bowls nothing like that that was like really grounded it was a very generic thing that uh, came back to really I'm too busy with my grades and my extracurriculars so I have to meal prep and it kind of fell flat the reason I bring that up is that when you look at this answer, it feels very different. Tell me about some kind of uh, setback you've had in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, most people go through life without too many setbacks, mm -hmm. but usually there's something that really was a problem for them, and it mm -hmm. can be from any part of your life. Mm -hmm. Again, preferably since high school. By mm -hmm. the way, e everything should be since high school, unless it was a continuation of something in high school into college. Um, some setback in your life that you experienced where you uh, had to figure out what to do to bounce back mm -hmm. from it. Absolutely. Um, so as I briefly mentioned earlier, but I'd like to go into more detail on, um, I have had a series of pretty significant ankle injuries that started when I was in the fifth grade but affected me all throughout high school and still to a minor degree affect me today. Um, when I was in the fifth grade, I, I had a series of sports injuries that ultimately led me to have um, basically a pretty messed up ankle for lack of a better term mm. and I had to have a complete ankle reconstruction and fixation when I was um, a sophomore in high school which is a really tough time I think yeah. um, in my life um, so while um, you know my I always remembered how privileged of a position I had been, it, been in that was a very personal setback that greatly affected me in high school um, I didn't get to go to homecoming I was in a wheelchair it was tough not to be able to hang out with my friends on the weekends um, but I think what I really learned from that experience um, is the importance of, of having a strong support system in your life, being able to rely on others, and also always keeping in mind the bigger picture. Notice this is the first time she said three or four sentences without um because this is easier for her to talk about. She has a lot more comfort with this story. She's very familiar with it. And you can tell as an interviewer, when you got someone in a corner, they start showing their nervous tics. But f clearly, this question has her on a roll. Also notice she's laughed a couple of times now and that has not been reciprocated by the interviewer. 
picking that up, I think, is recognizing, okay, this seems like it's going either in the wrong direction or he's just a very serious guy and I need to meet him there. So while there is a good example of an excellent answer. So I love this part where he breaks out of character. If you were just looking at him the entire time, no one could have told me he thought that was an excellent answer because he didn't show any of it, which is a great, great lesson to learn in mock interviews. How you perceive the other person can give you clues, but you're not always right about how they feel. This is actually how he feels. And I found it very surprising that he was such a big advocate for this story because it didn't seem like it. You know, even though it's high school or what, um, it still tells me a lot about how she handles setback. Because I can fully understand how at age 15 or 16, that would be a major setback for you. Uh, and how you respond to that and handle it, I think it was very educational for me to listen to her tell me how she did with that and how she viewed it. And that tells me that she has resiliency that will do her well in medical school and as a physician. So you can see he really loved it, even though it didn't seem like it as he was listening. That's just his version and how he demonstrates his active listening. Some people lean in, some people smile and laugh along with you, and some people are stone, stone cold serious, won't give you a single thing, but deep down inside, they're really listening, really trying to resonate with your story. That is a great example of that. And it's good to see it now and practice now because when you see that in real life, when you're on the interview trail, you won't get shook. I don't know Emma, but I know that because she's doing this, she's at least demonstrating a huge value of courage and character in front of a full classroom of pre-meds, some who may know her. It's very intimate to have someone, an entire classroom see how you interview. With that being said, my personal thoughts on answers like these always is record yourself and, and look and listen to see how you come across. Does Emma want to come across as this very straightforward, I'm coming right at you, I'm compassionate, people come to me for answers, I can connect with people. For me personally, I feel like that's very forward to say to someone, especially someone who you're meeting for the first time. I think it's important to advocate for yourself, but in a way that feels very genuine and authentic. And I'm sure she's being genuine, but from my personal experience, I would not say that I would come to a group of people or to a set of patients or to some of my colleagues and proclaim it in that way. I think I would rather do the actions that demonstrate that I am loving and I am compassionate and I would love for other people to come to that conclusion themselves. That Mike does have a way with people. Personally, it makes me feel a little bit odd when I am saying that about myself. That's just me and my commentary. So I know if I were in her shoes and I were saying that, as a listener, it doesn't feel authentic to me. I don't know how it feels for Emma, but this is a thought that I wanted to share with you guys. Listen to how you come across. Read what you're writing on your work activities in your personal statement. Does it match your personality, who you are, and how you want to be seen as a person? I don't think I have a strong ability. I know I have a strong ability. Personally, even though I feel that way about myself, I would never be the one to say it in a straightforward, genuine, authentic way. Even if people are saying you should advocate for yourself personally, I don't think that's the best way for me to demonstrate that character trait in my life. And to each their own, right? You can do it however, however you want, but the purpose of mock interviews is to see actually how you're coming across. And that's something that I would say, right? I think it's something that I would demonstrate on my resume or CV that I really love this or I really enjoy working with these people. But the thought of me saying I am passionate about the field of medicine feels very cliche. It feels very broad and not specific. Not a criticism to Emma but just a commentary on how it would feel if I were saying that myself. Okay, um, and then the last one, I believe that's a great tr attribute for a physician. Again, I come from a personality where I know that I don't know many things, that 
I recognize that there's a lot to learn and that I don't know what makes a great physician, but I'm trying my best, right? That's my perspective. It at least makes me feel more grounded and I feel makes me feel a little bit more relatable. If you feel confident that you know the great attributes of a physician and you're talking to a physician and you feel like that's the right move for you, then surely you can do something like that. But again, I really appreciate Emma for this mock interview experience because you can see she comes across as a very much different applicant than I. She got into medical school. She's certainly doing fine. She This was done in 2019, so we're probably colleagues somewhere. Um, but I love that she put herself out there so that we could all learn from her experience. She does a lot of fantastic things. I love the story about her ankle injuries and how well that flew um, off of her tongue and how well she shared how difficult it was. I love the details of not being able to go to homecoming, not being able to hang out with your friends, having seven surgeries and revisions. That really landed for me. And there are other examples that I think I would recommend doing differently. This is the power of the mock interview and this is why I hope that you see that this is such an advanced technique to succeed in modern day medical school admissions. These are four of my favorite, most advanced pre-med techniques that will make any pre-med more competitive. Genuinely, they're hard and require work to get through, but these things can certainly be your golden ticket to your dream medical school. And that's invaluable, especially considering how difficult it is to get into medical school today and how competitive your peers are as well. Links to all of the primary sources are available in the description and equally as important, the word for word email template that you can use today right now to build relationships with your dream medical schools is also available, always free in the description box below. And if you liked this video, you'll love the breakdown of pre-med red flags that you cannot miss before submitting your application to medical school. These nearly guarantee a medical school rejection and you will not want to forget these if you want to become a doctor. Thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next one.